Okay, let's start with your reactions. It's July 26th, the second day on Islam, and we're doing the Quran and um can't remember else. The, that's one of the main ones. So Tim, what reaction did you have? Okay, uh reaction I had was where it said the first change that must be grasped is the American diminished America's diminished ability to influence people. Yeah, I think they got that down packed for sure. Especially with technology. Nowadays, if you uh post something on social media, a lot of people are gonna sway their ideas towards it and beliefs towards it. Towards um, Islam or what? Like in general, like, like in general, just uh if you just grasping people, um um just influencing people in general, it's gonna be easy with social media. So if you don't really know about Islam, like for example, and somebody on social media is talking about it, you can be like, oh, okay, I wanna uh, just see what that is. But it's hard to influence without social media. If you gotta physically go in person. So yeah. Yeah. I think I think the article was about the way we reacted to 9-11. Or else, yeah, we just don't have the moral stand we, we used to have. But it is true, Tim, that social media, I don't know, because I don't go on it. But, and I don't know if people are just using it as an excuse either. Maybe people really are thoughtful. Like I've just given up having a opinion. I just try to teach students. Um, but I know the students are pretty worried about it. And that's probably legit because they're going to have to run the society in 20 years. Um, so how do you feel about that, Tim? Do you think social media is going to make it really hard for you to take up leadership positions, um, to get along with fellow workers? I feel like, yeah, because everybody wants to be politically correct. So social media kind of like paints the picture for you. And if you don't follow it, it's like, oh, you're doing something wrong or you're like, you need to be canceled and stuff like that. So I feel like, yeah. That's too bad. I, I'm in a, I'm kind of glad I got old enough so that I don't, I'm not influenced by it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was, pretty vulnerable until I got tenure. And the reason professors get tenure is so that they can say and do what they think is best. And they don't have to just always worry about what students say. Um, so I have heard about, you know, students saying stuff on social media about professors that, gosh, I just think that would be hard. Um, anyway, yeah, group think. Okay, Jordan. Did you have something you wanted to say about the reading for today? I don't know. Let's see. Not really. OK. Um, Alyssa? Um, I actually wrote my notes also along the lines of group think. Um, because like social media, not to sound like a broken record, but it really does help divide everyone because you want to be on the side that's right, but different people have different opinions on what's right. And I mean, it's so uh, rightly broadcasted on social media. And if you're right or wrong and people can go back and see if you ever were wrong. And so it really helps create this negative image around anything from anyone's point of view, I feel like. Well, yeah, I, I can't even imagine posting an opinion because I would spend the rest of my life obsessing about who saw it and what they might be doing, right? Um, so I do post my classes though, and I put it on public access to the public. I did have a reaction one time on after I posted my Islam lectures 
and it was some vitriol about Islam. But I still post it because I think it gives you a different perspective on Islam, right? It just tries to be fair. Um, anyway, all right. So what I'll do then, where's Ryan? She disappeared. Um, I'll go over the Quran stuff and then I'll have you react, right? So again, I think I'll call on you. Let me get how many times I'll call on you. Um, I'll call on you about the Quran. I'll talk about the Quran a little bit and then you all react. I'll talk about the news articles and then I want a reaction. I might go through two rounds of that because there's a couple important things. And then we'll do the um, stuff on women, all right? Okay, so the first Quran issue is, I said in the video, I'm going to read the introduction here. And the point I want to pass down is if you remember the top quote from reading the chapter in Houston Smith was that um, Islam is misunderstood by the West, right? And so this is the introduction um, written by the guy who translated the Quran. So, you know, my first thought about somebody who translated it, and this is 1806, right? So in 1806, somebody decided to translate it. Um, it was first translated in 1734. Um, that's amazing, right? And then you find out why they translated it. All right, so here's the quote, and I want you to think about this and think about the legacy that people leave behind, right? Just like on social media, you leave a legacy, like this is your story. This is how people remember you. So this is what it says. Good reader, the great Arabian imposter now at last, after a thousand years, um, is by way of France, arrived in England, and his Koran, or Book of Errors, parentheses, a brat as deformed as the parent and as full of heresies as his scald head was full of scruffle, hath learned to speak English. I suppose this piece is exposed by the translator to the public view, no otherwise than some monster brought out of Africa for people to gaze, not to dote upon, and as the sight of a monster or misshapen creature should include, induce the beholder to praise God, who hath not made him such. Thank God I'm not like this, right? So should the reading of this Quran excite us both to bless God's goodness toward us in this land who enjoy the glorious light of the gospel and behold the truth in the beauty of holiness who suffers so many countries to be blinded and enslaved with this misshapen issue of Muhammad's brain being brought forth by the help of no other midwifery than of a Jew making use of a tame pigeon, which he had taught to pick corn out of his ears instead of the Holy Ghost and causing silly people to believe that in his falling sickness, he had conference with the angel Gabriel. Okay, guys, what do you think of that? To say things like that. Somebody? Um, I think that just to say things like that, you're setting yourself up to view Islam in like a negative way. I feel like you're going in with a bad image already created. I mean, does the person have any evidence, right? This is what happens when religion gets disconnected from any evidence or science or any any ideas about human flourishing and whether we 
you know, are by nature social and political, we need to get along. It just is really using religion as a weapon. Does that make sense? So it makes, you know, we've been at war, you know, there's been this real animosity between Christians and Muslims for a long time. Um, but there is a story of a culture in Southern Spain and a little over a century after Muhammad died, there was a huge fight between the Sunni and Shia families over who's gonna take over governing the religion. And one family in Damascus was getting massacred. So one of the few family members left, he went to Southern Spain and he started a translation project where rabbis, priests, and Imam came together and they all translated the Old Testament and the New Testament into Arabic. And they all learned Arabic so that there would be interfaith dialogue. And so that culture, it's called Andalusian culture, it lasted until 1492. It had its ups and downs, okay? Uh, it was amazing. I didn't know this history. But there is a history of toleration between Jews, Christians, and Muslims after Muhammad died. The other thing is Muhammad himself wrote the Charter of Medina, and he gave Jews and Christians uh, protections, rights. So it's amazing what we don't know. <laughs> and then in 1492, which should be a familiar date, Ferdinand and Isabella told the Jews that when they came into power, they would tolerate them. But then they did it. They started persecuting Jews. So Christopher Columbus was going to you know, sail over to India, he thought, to get some spices. And he thought that India, if it had spices, it would be this higher level of civilization and culture. And he thought that the language of civilization and culture is Arabic. So he hired a rabbi who knew Arabic to come onto the Santa Maria. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Like you would never think that. Uh, there's so much history that we don't know that would be really helpful to understand. Um, anyway, I just had to tell that story. Now, how many of you have read, I mean, listen to the video, do a thumbs up or something. Okay, good. Half. What about you, Alexis? I'm currently eating with family. I really can't hear. I'm sorry. I'm trying. Have you, did you read it? Read which one? The assignment. I mean, did you listen to the video for today? I listened to it while we were on in the car. So somewhat can't really remember anything. Okay. I've been with my family all day. What about Jordan? What about you? Okay. Just um, like what my overall beliefs were. What? What my overall like take was. Well, just uh, actually just your reaction to when I was reading from the Quran. I don't know. I find a lot of like comfort in it almost because I think there are a lot of parts of it that are very similar. I don't know. I think with all religion, I just have religious trauma kind of. I don't oh. really vibe within religion but I find like understanding in it so like for me it's another religious text that makes sense in the context of its time okay um in the context of its time where everyone who wasn't I mean white and in power or I mean just for like higher class was kind of condemned but it, it's whatever I, I don't know I, I don't really find a lot that's what I find kind of hard about this class that we talk about religion a lot and that we're going to talk more about like philosophical notions or like ideas like humanity like hum, humanism humanism 
but we talk a lot about religion and I don't know I, I just I think that religion has its place in philosophy but it shouldn't be the primary thought in philosophy yeah okay I mean the reason that I did it this way is because I I think lion students in general um, have an interest and because these traditions were not called religions, the West called them religions. And also because there's a lot more people affected by them. Um, humanism is a very Western, uh, you know, enlightenment Western orientation toward the world. And um, I like it, I, I still, but that, that would be my reason is that, um, I, th I thought the that that lion students would need to know this stuff more than um, a more esoteric kind of study of humanism but I mean I might be wrong and um, that was why though there was a rationale um, let's see anyway so the the other thing is linking science and religion you know there's a need for linking reason and faith, and that's a major. I'm, I'm not story. trying to say that like it doesn't make sense because it does. Like morality and philosophy are hand in hand, just as morality and religion are hand in hand. It does make sense, especially whenever like where we are in the South. You want to make sure everyone understands that we're more similar in the ways that we are different. Like I get that. I just yeah. I personally just don't enjoy talking about religion. Yeah, no, I understand, Jordan. I just I did feel like this is what the people need because religion is used as a weapon and there is a lot of um, okay a lot of um, intolerance and stuff like that so um, I like to work actually students can work on a um, advanced seminar paper on humanism or whatever else they want to. So that's where I kind of give students a chance to do that. But OK, so Ryan, what was your reaction to reading the Quran or listening to the video um, about when I read from the Quran? Sorry, I had to move out of my dorm because the Wi-Fi shut off there. Um, we're talking about, okay, from what we took. Okay. So let's see, going to my note. Um, okay. In one of the, I believe it was, I'm not sure which handout it was, but it was talking about like the violence in the name of religion leads to a lack of respect for worldwide religion, for all religions. And I thought that was interesting because if, um, if there is no respect that's due like to violence, then it is disrespecting other religions because it's kind of limiting what other people can believe and what they feel comfortable believing. So I agree with what um, that was saying there. And Did also you... the sword, they were saying how like, um, what was it the saying about like, they equated like the religion to a sword or something like that. Right um kind of i don't know perpetuating the idea that like that religion is saying that you should like i guess you can interpret it in different ways but how i saw it was kind of in like a negative way so i kind of i don't know didn't really like that because i know some like we talked about how different verses can pull um different you can pull different meanings from it so yeah well, Muhammad did conquer the Arabian prince, uh, area, peninsula. And um, so Houston Smith, so then you get associated, it's the religion of the sword. So Houston Smith just said, yes, but the countries were very chaotic internally. And he actually, his influence led to a more ordered way of life, you know, praying five times a day. And it brought order to the countries and they were better off. So there's two different ways to look at it. And there would definitely be stories, right? There would be stories of brutality and massacres, but then there would be stories of people appreciating and having a more stable society. Um, so, so that's why, you know, he's just trying to 
say there's a reason why it's called the religion of this word, but that is not necessarily legitimate. And then he just says every religion will hide its real motives underneath religion, right? Like the Crusades. Um, anyway, so that I think that was what you're referring to, I think. Um, so I'll just point out that the Quran, what does it have? It has this view of personal choice that there's a final judgment that you will get paradise, the Garden of Eden, or you will roast in hell forever. There's a view that um, there's a place that says, show forbearance to the unbelievers, grant them a little respite. So right, just don't just, you know, be sociable toward unbelievers. That's what he says in one place, right? And then it says somewhere else, um, in Surya 9, to kill the infidels. Well, that's because it was in the middle of a battle. It was a historical context. Um, then there's one where the Allah is scolding Muhammad because he ignored the poor person and he deferred to the rich person. So Muhammad is not perfect. Um, then uh, people in a local area offered Muhammad um to to give him power if he would worship at their shrine you know so that sounds like um buddha and jesus were always tempt also tempted uh to get power to trade in um human power you know the powers of nations for spiritual power then it has a section about moses it has a section about abraham noah lot um, I personally was really surprised when I went through this stuff and and saw this I did I had no idea um, let's see let me see what else oh and then he does talk he talks about the Jews um, who does okay we ordained them for them in the Torah so he explains that God um, gave the Jews the Torah, and then he gave the Jew, the Christians, we gave them the gospel. And now Muhammad is the seal of the prophet. So he's finally instituted a way of life into the same message. So he tried to integrate right, the religions, uh, but it didn't go very well necessarily. Um, Let's see, it talks of the sections about women, that they did have a right to half as much as men. So I have a section of that. And just for you to know, that was very progressive in its day. Um, and then there's a section about um, charging people for money, usury, and that that's bad. And um, the Jews, uh, the wrongdoing of the Jews, we made illicit for them certain things. Uh, this was because they were taking usury, right? Um, but, you know, that's gotten to be a big deal because Christians, of course, live on credit <laughs> and loans themselves. But the Muslims have, again, as I said, a different kind of bank where the claim is that it's not usury. So they have ways of um, taking care of money issues without usury. Um, and, and the Quran says that Jesus is not God, right? And that's, they just disagree on that. Um, so they agree to disagree. And then the question is, is it more important, the lessons about how to live, the teachings, or is it more important to kill each other based on whether you think Jesus was God or not? And that's sort of up to you. <laughs> okay. So then the next thing I wanted to comment on was the news. And I did ask you to read these news articles. All right, so I would like you to respond to this one because it has a lot of important points that have been true in every tradition that we've talked about. This particular sur uh, surya describes this attempt 
to form a state on the Arabian Peninsula. And it does say slay the pagans. And then the scholars say, right? Scholars debate this. Uh, they differentiate between the message of the religion and the historical context. There's a difference between religious Islam and political Islam. And I want you to think about that in terms of Christianity, Judaism, Islam, I mean, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Confucianism, um, right? There's, there's factions among scholars, even scholars. Some are humanists and they advocate toleration, whereas some are more advocating holy war. There's factions among the religious leaders. There's secular intellectuals versus religious extremists. There's liberals versus conservatives. This goes all the way back to Socrates arguing with Euthyphro. Um, there's literal interpretations versus contextual and metaphorical. There's literal jihad versus the inner war you have with yourself. And um, there's this claim, you know, that Islam is under assault and there's this big war between the West and the, uh, the Arabs, Arab world. Um, all right. So the culture versus the religion, ver right? Same, same issues that we've um, talked about throughout the semester. Are lay people qualified to interpret the spirit of a religion? This is a big issue because in the Baptist church, as far as I know, anybody can interpret things any way they want. And maybe, I mean, in the Methodist church too, they had little um, uh, groups that met every week because they were supposed to think about how to apply the scripture, the tradition, the um, reason, um, and let's see, they were supposed to integrate all these and figure out what decisions to make in their lives and they would meet every week. So there wasn't any big doctrine there. Um, so how does that work, right? Um, all right. Um, then there's keeping faith with Islam in a new world. And these are the two I did ask you to read. Um, the, so let's keep, keep something in mind, write down something related to that article, because that's important. But here's the one that I particularly, oh, this one has a lot of quotes from the Quran, which sacred text says Jesus is the word of God, it's the Quran. Um, and the Quran says a lot of stuff that, you know, most people have no idea it would say that. But this is the one, these articles here, down here, are what I wanted to bring your attention to. Um, yeah, I think, Tim, did you read this about um, keeping the faith with Islam in a new world? Um, how do we, after 9-11, how do we, you know, develop decent relationships between American Muslims and also Muslims around the world and um, Christians? And then he talks about Al Jazeera. And I was saying that I... When I was in the hospital in Indonesia, I watched BBC World, CNN World, and Al Jazeera. And I just thought, wow, this is way better news, way better news. And if you watch those news programs instead of American media, you would have a huge global picture of what's going on in the world. American news. 93% of it is just US, it's not even international. And in the 7% is mostly what's going on with our troops. So it, it is extremely ignorant, really, because the world just keeps going, it really doesn't care. And so I, when I'm in Indonesia, I listen to that news and I get a totally different picture of the world in my head. Um, so all of that is important, but here's the, okay. And it's very important if you 
if you want to win people over, you want to have peace in your country, you have to understand the world um, and how these other um, media outlets portrayed the Iraq war and the Israeli-Palestine conflict. That is really important. But anyway, so here is an article about the university um, in Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina. This is where the big demonstration was. They, they gathered to discuss their summer reading assignment, which was a book about the Quran. Okay, just hours before that, um, there was a lawsuit from a conservative group that sued to stop them, right? The lawyers spent the weekend arguing that the discussions were forced Islamic indoctrination, okay? So the students came back, what year was this? This was the next year, the next fall. So they acted on this really quickly. Um, so they returned to school. This was a little less than a year after 9-11. Um, they rushed right after 9-11. People were rushing to prove their tolerance toward your Islam. But after it didn't take long before um, the political leaders used it, used that to justify going to war against Saddam, even though they knew that Saddam was not behind 9-11. And there are emails to verify that. They just wanted to use 9-11 as an excuse because they wanted to go into Iraq and they wanted to set up 134 military bases so we could have cheap oil. And that's all documented. But the main thing is that it, it the first reaction was toleration. And then quickly after that, it became this big wave of intolerance. Um, Okay, the assignment, the argument was that the assignment violated constitutional provisions against state sponsored religion. My goodness. I mean, assigning a book about the Korean. Look at what Dr. Beck does. My gosh, you're gonna get hung by the by the, you know, teeth. <laughs> what what would they do to me? Like I assigned the real Quran, even though it's a translation. I assign the Gita, I assign the Analects, I assign all this stuff, right? Um, and if you take my class, it's required. So and does that mean I'm indoctrinating you? This is religious indoctrination, forced religious indoctrination. Um, all right, so I also think it's funny that when the, me, the journalists went and interviewed the students, the one student said the only problem was it was boring. <laughs> and students will do that, right? They're just like, why are you making this so political? It's just boring. And so the, a student says, the fact is we're at a liberal arts school that's supposed to open our minds. You're supposed to get a new perspective. You don't get a new perspective if you don't try learning about new things. Um, and then another student said, I thought it was going to be some off the wall religion, and it wasn't, you know. Um, so, and the, the big debate is whether it provided a complete picture, right? And so that's true, just like Houston Smith, like he always gives the positive side. Um, the notion of it didn't mention uh, religious war, right? Holy war, but, you know, again, it should have mentioned it. There's also holy war in the Gita. There's holy war in Christianity. Um, there's holy war in Judaism. So as long as you can get that straight, that they're all there. Um, and then even the kids on the campus crusade for Christ, um, they didn't think intolerance was a good thing. Um, Jesus wanted people to be more open-minded. Okay, so that was that article. And then the reaction to it, there was an editorial that said um, this, the, the lawsuit exhibits a profound lack of understanding of what America is about. And I do want you to react to this. Um, there, you know, the Christian 
coalition wants us to be just as repressive as the Arab Muslims are, right? Um, so the problem isn't that our students are reading a book about the Quran. The problem is that students in Saudi Arabia and Muslim countries are not being asked to read the sacred texts of other civilizations, including the foundational texts of American democracy, the Constitution, the Federalist Papers. The fact that they ignore diverse texts is the source of our their weakness. And the fact that we embrace them is the source of our strength. Um, I mean, I obviously believe that, but I do want you to, to take some time to think about this, okay? Because America is based on this belief that you can expose people to a lot of stuff and you can give them a lot of freedom and you can trust them and the final, at the end of the day, to live better lives for that reason, that they won't you know, go off the wall. But if you keep people ignorant, then that's the source of the loss of democracy because then you can use their ignorance to manipulate them. A politician, if you don't know anything about Islam, you're much more likely to go to war against Muslims because the politician will just tell you whatever he or she has to to get you all lathered up. But if you read and you have knowledge, you're less likely to end up with authoritarianism. Um, the freedom of thought and multiple perspectives is what nurtures a critical mind. A critical mind is the root of innovation, scientific inquiry, and entrepreneurship. So um, that, that is what I really want you to think about. And I also you know, want you to consider if you'd want to write that in your final. I mean, you don't have to, but I do think this is a big deal. Um, Tim, what do you think about those two articles, like that episode that they describe? Well, for one, how like politicians are, like you said, politicians are bringing like people for, to authoritarianism. It's not really good because like people should have their own like way of doing stuff instead of just being encouraged by politicians. And then it was the religious leaders um, that actually brought the lawsuit, but they also got tied into politics. So mm -hmm. they associated themselves with a certain political party too, which again, our founders did not want that to happen, right? Yeah. But anyway, go ahead, Tim. Okay. And then what about um says Mm. Control roar, differentiate between message of the religion and historical context. I feel like that, like you keep saying, like for the last few um um lectures, that you want to make sure the what they're saying is not is not too off. You want to like at least have a little bit of assurance of if it, if it actually happened and stuff like that, instead of just hearing somebody and hoping you accept what they're saying. You want to like have a little bit of historic context as in like a little bit of um, information behind it, if you know what I mean. So if you take Dr. Buby's Old Testament or New Testament classes, those are the whole class is about all that contextual stuff. And I, I took an Old Testament class in college and it was really interesting. I mean, it didn't occur to me that my faith would depend upon that it, that it was inerrant or something. Um, but it just explained that there's a whole lot of different ways you can understand, like the story of Cain and Abel. Um, anyway, uh, okay, uh, Alyssa, what did you think of that episode? Um, they made, I wrote down, it made me think of how dangerous it is, like it reassured how dangerous it is to not be open-minded, open 
and it's not just dangerous for the individual who is close-minded it's dangerous to those that they're like shutting off because obviously like those people are going to be like well they don't understand me so why would I treat them with respect and it's just a toxic system for the whole to be closed-minded okay what about you Ryan Are you there? Yeah, sorry. I'm just trying to make sure I'm taking down notes and stuff. But oh, okay. Yeah, I think just reiterating what Tim was saying about making sure that what we're reading and what we're also how we translate it is close to what it's actually saying. And I talked about that last class about looking at the context of what is being said and making sure that we're not misinterpreting. And some people misinterpret on purpose to control people. And it's used um, like when you're talking about people blindly listening to government, even though, um, you know, they may think otherwise, they don't even like question it. And I think that's like a real issue. Do you think it's going to be an issue in your lifetime? I think Have people you- are like that. Yeah, for sure. I think. I met people that doesn't even question anything around them. They just live their everyday life and they don't think about anything deeper than what they're doing in the present day. And so what will happen is if there's a crisis, they will be suckers, right? For whatever a politician tells them. Is that, is that what you're thinking? Yeah. I think those are the people that's just going to follow whatever is being fed to them. And I think that's not the, the good, good way to make a productive society because I think you need to question, like not trying to cause an uproar, but at least question. And then that might stir something and you might figure out knowledge that you never knew before, which could cause reform or change or whatever. That's why it's important to have people to talk to, right? As opposed to social media. Is that, would you say that's true? Yeah, okay. Um, Jordan, what about you? Um, I I put in chat, I was talking about like the, I wonder how different the perspective on Islamic people and uh, Islam would be if 9-11 didn't happen and the rhetoric in response to it. because I know that I had some like, you know, initial responses that had to train out of myself because of everything that you hear, you know, like it's even a meme to be like Alu Akbar, which is actually a religious saying in, in Islamic people. Like Alu Akbar just means praise God, but people act like it's just something people yell before they shut off a bomb. And it, it's, it's disconcerting to, um, see it happening in another another religious culture because like that's what happens to jewish people all the time (laughs) i mean i don't condone it i don't enjoy it um i don't know how to fix it so yeah and partially due to uh, a lot of comedic people um i think this relates back to like this topic we were talking about one time where it was like, when, when does comedy stop being just comedy and like political commentary and influencing the culture around them? And I think in the cases of like Family Guy, which is a very universal show that a lot of Americans watch, or- um, What is it? Like what? what's the plot? Is it, does it feed prejudice or get rid of prejudice or what? Oh, in, I would say it enhances it from my personal perspective. Very prejudice. Yeah, very- In a comedic way. Feeding on stereotypes to be comedic. It's called lampshading. Um, It's this idea that you're throwing in a notion that is so ridiculous, they're making fun of it. But in in actuality, they're making it more of a commonplace theme. So like in Family Guy, it's, about like an all-American family you know they have three kids and a dog and like I don't know I haven't watched the show personally I just know about it um 
but it's all about how the main guy i think his name's like peter um he he's just like this uh you know all-american guy who just is a working class guy who's extremely racist extremely xenophobic um homophobic like all the phobics that you can think about but because it's comedy it's seen as all right and i think that's kind of a common notion like them in south park (laughs) i feel like are big proponents of what like comedy was considered in like the 2010s you know right well way long way back it was all in the family that might have been the first one did you know that tv show i've heard of it yeah well and the the father was like that and that was when i was growing up and i i kept thinking you know people are thinking this is funny norman lear and um i'm just not sure you know if they're actually learning to kind of laugh at themselves and give up their prejudices or if this is just feeding the prejudice um the other reason is because i grew up in Lake Wobegon. Okay, I grew up, I literally know people in this radio show that was there for like 35 years about this little town called Lake Wobegon, right? And it idealized it and they were cute and they were kind of cute in their ignorance, you know. And I kept thinking, uh, I, you don't live there. Like, you don't know it's not that funny if you live there. And so right now, that same area of the country where I grew up is having huge problems with their Somalian immigrants, anti-Muslim sentiment. It doesn't surprise me at all, because I mean, I went to high school there, but I wasn't convinced that all this comedy was really helping people understand their prejudice and give them up, give it up. Um, but you know, I don't, don't, it's unfortunate because the show itself is very, um, just phobic in general, but the actual actors, like I know Mila Kunis is a big advocate for, um, for LGBT people and for just a lot of different, you know, civil rights. Um, and so is Seth MacFarlane. Uh, Seth MacFarlane, when Black Lives Matter was happening, uh, donated, I think, $2 million. But their show that they're both on advocate for the exact opposite. And I think that it's hard for public, for people in the public opinion who don't do any research past whatever they see to understand that this is like comedy for the sake of understanding that these people are being ridiculous. Not for it being like, oh, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, Jewish people are like that. People who believe, you know, it's just, I don't know. It's kind of like what we were talking about with um, cancel culture, uh, but the opposite, where people take everything that they hear with credibility and they emulate that. And it's really unfortunate they don't look past that, but I can't force anyone to do that. So I don't know. Yeah, it's... It's sad, and that's part of the polarization problem, right? I mean, you really, if you want a democracy, you can't have your defenses up against everybody you don't know. You know, you have to basically trust people. Uh, or you're or you're going to be looking for some outside authority to, to protect you from your neighbor, and then that, that person will just take over. So... Yeah, it's somewhat, it's worrisome. I did, let's see. Oh, I can't find it. All right. I had a quote. One of my students was talking about stress and the relationship between individuals and culture, right? And she had a grandmother who after 9-11 got very paranoid and she was even diagnosed with a, some kind of phobia complex. But she started carrying around a gun. (laughs) It was like, oh, so I'm supposed to feel safer because her grandma has a gun. And um, they went to the state fair or something and a a woman was there with the hijab. And she said, how much you wanna bet she's got a gun underneath her burqa, you know, geez. Um, 
And so that caused the, my student a lot of stress, I guess so. And I just don't understand why people think more guns is going to solve our problems. I don't think there's evidence of that, frankly. Um, and the money that goes to police officers doesn't go to education, right? There's only so much money to spread around. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of the pro-education side of things. Um, all right, now we have the Islam and women. All right, first of all, I want to ask you, I don't know if you read it, what stereotypes or what do you associate with Islam and women? Um, Tim, what did you anticipate reading if you read a chapter on Islam and women? Actually, uh, I didn't get to, uh, I didn't get to. Uh, you hear me? Yeah. I didn't, I didn't get to read that one. You should, you should actually talk really close to the microphone because it kind of fades in and out. I didn't get to read that one. Oh, okay. And you didn't do the outline either? For the last essay? Islam and women. It was the chapter from the Justice Men and Women. Um, um, actually, I'm just asking you without reading it, what would be your thoughts? What are the associations you have? Well, back then, especially um, with women rights, they rarely, they rarely would ever speak up and have their own thoughts. It always had to be under a man. I don't think that was right. I mean, if it's good to be under under a man if he's like taking care of the house and all that you're just cleaning but at the same time it's not good because you want to have your own freedom and to do whatever so it's like for me it's kind of it's kind of i'm not too lenient on either side because there is a benefit for the um for how the old times were but then there are a lot of downfalls to it as well okay um Alyssa, did you have do you have associations with Islam and women or have, have you um, studied it or was there something you read in the chapter that stuck out? Um, as far as like internal like associations, not necessarily in a negative way, but I do more closely associate uh, conservatism with women in Islam. And like, that's not like, in a, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. Just, I think they are typically more reserved in a lot of areas than like Western culture. Um, but that was kind of all I had. Okay. Um, Jordan? Uh, I was about to say, like to piggyback off of Alyssa, um, I think that my view originally of um, Muslim culture was infantilizing women making them out to be not able to take care of themselves and not able to be, you know, functioning members of society. Um, and I think that is in part due to my independence as a woman in the United States uh, and my idea of what freedom is. But in another part due to, I, I do think that they are um, more conservative and like, made to be so it's not necessarily something that they I think that people in uh, American culture who are Muslim who wear hijab wear um, a burqa or some along those lines uh, are more free to choose to do that for themselves than the, if they would in an Islamic state so like I feel like people here who choose to do that I'm more along the lines of oh this is a religious practice they're choosing to do this to respect their religion but for some reason whenever I view it in another culture I'm like they're being forced into this they don't you know but it could be very well that they do want to do that and it's a part of their culture that has been forced upon them it could be both because okay. like that's how they grew up okay what about you Ryan um yeah I mean so my best friend she goes to the lion Aisha and so while being her friend, I was able to learn, like, really, what, what is this for? You know, why do you guys cover your hair? Why is this? 
because how it's portrayed on the media and what I see is that it's like oppression. Like, you know, we hear stories about women can't drive. Now they can, like, you know, they can't go out and have jobs. They can't do like with the Malala story, like they can't, couldn't get education. They got, get shot by trying to get education. So you hear all of that, but then hearing her uh, talk about her religion and why she does what she does she looks at it as liberation, like, you know, being modest. And that's what she wants to do. Like, she doesn't feel forced to do it. She wants to do it. And so that gave me another perspective of, you know, people practicing that religion. Of course, there's people that's forced to do it in those kind of um, terrorist states in the Middle East, some of those places. And um, they may, they are obligated, not feel obligated. They are obligated by law or whatever it may be to do that. Um, but at least like what Jordan was saying, like in Western society, at least in America, like they may feel like because we have an you know open government or you know they have the choice by law they have a choice whether they want to wear it or not um, they're more free to choose what they want to wear. Right. Okay. Um, so I did teach um, in Asia, and the the women were a lot of them were Muslim. They were from Bangladesh, Myanmar, Rohingya Muslims. Um, in Afghanistan. Okay, so the Taliban is horrible. I mean, there's no question, horrible toward women. Um, but the students know that that isn't really the way Muhammad was. So we already talked about that Muhammad, the Quran has a lot more rights for women than they had in the culture, right? The fact that they could inherit wealth, that's incredible. And then if they married more than one wife, they, she had to have her own place to live and she had to be taken care of. These were really radical. In other words, she's not a piece of property. She's not an extension of your ego. Um, the other thing is that um, which one is more oppressed? The girl, okay, in the US, we have this, oh, Jordan, go ahead. I just want to comment on what Ryan was talking about. Um, I think, because I know I, uh, Aisha too, I like, I know her, she's in the um, honors program. And I, I do think that in our culture, the choice to be modest is almost seen as oppressive simply because women are viewed through a sexual lens almost always. And for that reason, um, the idea of a woman choosing that is seen as impressive. So I feel like that's the reason why women who uh, celebrate Islamic culture in the United States get so villainized is because of that reason. It's because people feel like the inherent like sexualized need for their bodies. And because they aren't doing that, they're all of a sudden weird and other than. Yeah, I mean, for me, what I think is that women's bodies are getting used by men, right? So it's like badminton, birdie. My women are better because they can dress however they want. If they want to wear a bikini to school, that's fine. Well, my women are better because they dress in the burqa, you know? And it's just like <laughs> both of them, The one of them assumes that women have to cover their bodies why? Because men, you know, can't handle it. Uh, is it or because the women otherwise their sexuality would be out of control, or because they they don't want to get treated like an object? And the best way to for people not to be thinking about sex is to cover up your body, right? That could be a reason, right? You just get treated like a person, not a body. Um, on the other hand. You should be able to dress and express yourself through your clothing and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, when women say, oh, I do whatever I want, but they spend a lot of time every morning and a lot of money basically dressing for the male gaze and they compete for the male gaze, that's not healthy either, I think. And so the article starts out with, well, let's talk about the politics of women's bodies, and let's try to see it from both points of view. So I, I do like um, that, that you can see it from more than one point of view, 
wait a sec, what happened? Um, yeah, the politics of body images, right? Women are covered. What does that mean? Who's more oppressed? The ones who are covered or the ones who, you know, spend time and money exposing their bodies and trying to get the male gaze. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so then again, Islam was not originally thought of as a religion that was a way for Westerners to marginalize them. So that same thing happened, right? As Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism. Um, the Quran can be interpreted as pro-feminist. So here's all the things about it that are pro-feminist. It has rights and dignity of women compared to everything else, but it can be interpreted as sexist and a violation of women's rights. It's a, Islam is a total way of life. Um, how does it, anti-feminist, men can have four wives, they can marry Jews or Christians, um, and they don't have to be veiled, right? So women are treated differently. And then there's also strict supervision and all that stuff. So that stuff um, is anti-feminist. And then the pro-feminist, right, earlier on, it was a lot less sexist, which is the same with the early church. After Jesus died, the early church was very egalitarian. So these, these religions are much more egalitarian until they start becoming institutionalized and have power and have official authority figures who go and study in universities and learn languages and have all this you know privilege. And then they start then it's not egalitarian even among the men, but also then it, it tends to divide people. Um, the Quran defends the weak against the strong. Well, actually, so does Christianity. I mean, a lot of religions do that and they're still sexist. Um, all right, let's see. Um, uh, let's see. It tells men to treat women well, but then men make judgments about what the appropriate treatment is. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so it has a male bias right in it and um, venerating the, the text. It, we really need to shift the text and Sharia law is very important because it developed within the context of sexist culture. This is so important. Muhammad explicitly forbade collecting his sayings because he knew that his sayings would be venerated and be given too much authority. And so people would not, they would focus on the written word rather than the internal word. Same thing Jesus was worried same thing Socrates is worried about, same thing Confucius. You know, they're all worried about the same thing, Buddha. Um, so I, I think that's important because Sharia law is a big deal. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. They were given the authority of the Quran, and that was against Muhammad's wishes. And it was codified hundreds of years after his death, which happens in a lot of these traditions. Um, Okay, let's see. Um, using the Quran, how can you promote progressive treatment of women? And he has all these um, suggestions for how to do it. And also pluralism in Islam. Um, early on, again, Muhammad was a lot more egalitarian and then it just sort of changed. And it focuses on God so that same as all the religions, like there's no gender in the idea of God. It's not material, it's not material, right? It's this big kind of energy. Um, there's nothing sexist about that. There's nothing that should distinguish uh, people from each other, should divide people. Um, so Jordan, did you have a comment or did you just did you want to react? Your hand is up, and I don't know. I just forgot to turn it off. Oh, I okay. Have to say. What? 
I don't really have anything to say, sorry. Okay, all right, so, so that's the issue there. Now, I thought since we have extra, oh, there's Michael, he appeared. All right, Michael, um, what was your reaction to the reading or the video? Did you see, do either one or both? Uh, yes, I did watch the video. If you'll get, just give me one second to get my stuff pulled up. Okay. So when we're done with Michael, I'll give you a slideshow of some stuff in Indonesia because I have really cool slides and I think I have time to do it, which lots of times I run out of time, but so go ahead. Are you ready, Michael, yet? Okay. Okay, so I kind of like how, um, I feel like the the Quran, like the at least the, the little bits that I read are, um, they feel like more kind of true to like what was actually happening like we've talked a lot about how like the bible for example is like a lot of stories i guess uh and how like it's uh some things are kind of difficult to believe and i really enjoyed how like i enjoyed but um i liked reading like the little the parts that i read um just because it felt like it was more like a I don't want to say like straightforward, but it didn't feel like I was reading this information through this person who had heard right. it from this person who saw it here. You know, it didn't it didn't feel like that at all. No, it was one long message. Right. Um, from Allah delivered through Gabriel to Muhammad. So it is it's a different kind of document. Right. Sorry, my computer's about to die. And then we didn't have power. <laughs> um, and then um, I honestly think that I might like go ahead and do this last paper on like a comparison between the uh, just like how the, the, the structure of a religion can affect the outcome of like how that like how the people of that religion uh, act, you know. Okay. Um, which kind of goes a lot along with what we were talking about yesterday uh, quite a bit more, but I had been thinking about that too. I do think Islam lends itself to even more kind of literalism, because you could say literally every word in the Quran is inerrant, right? It's straight from God, like it's written that way. Whereas the Old Testament and New Testament are not even written, they aren't written that way. Right. And so that doctrine of inerrancy, I don't know where the heck that came from, because I don't think it's the intention of the people who put that book together. Um, whereas with Islam, you know, that was the idea. Um, but the thing is, Muhammad understood the problem of fundamentalism, which is why it was really important that he didn't want his sayings to get written down. He didn't want Sharia law. He didn't want that stuff because he knew it could become uh, a real straitjacket and a tool for power, mm -hmm. right? And completely yeah. lose the spirit of the religion. Right. Yeah, okay. So just like the Torah and the Talmud in the Old Testament, it could, they the rabbis just lost track of what was important. Um, I also think that just the notion of legalism and literalism versus dialogue and you know adaptation and all that sort of stuff, it, these are issues you're gonna have to deal with your whole life, right? There might be certain things where you just decide, I gotta set my foot down here. Like I'm not gonna, this is not negotiable, right? I'm not gonna doubt this. But in general, the world changes. And it is important, liberal education, right? That your mind is liberated from getting fixated on one way of dealing with things because you're a lot better off if you have a free mind and you will listen. Does that make sense, Michael? Yes, it does. I mean, honestly, in my mind, I don't have any negative thoughts about, you know, the um you know right-wing extremists 
what I think about is I wish I could sit down and talk to them, right? I really just wish, or or just a person on the street, like the woman who is my uh, apartment manager. Um, she's, you know, says stuff like Biden should be impeached or whatever. And all I really want to do is listen to what's the story that you're hearing, because everybody's hearing a narrative. Maybe right. they get it from Fox News, but it, it's never literally what Fox says. It's, well, what are you taking in? Like, how right. are you making sense of all this? Well, and then I also think that, like, because of how, like, polarizing the media and um, some of the last presidents have been, there's a lot of, like, aggression towards talking to people who, uh, who you know, if, like, if you are, not you specifically, but if someone is, like rel relatively, you know, um, uh, conservative, and then they go and try to ask somebody who's very um, Republican, you know, about just their ideas. I think that there's so much um, aggression these days. Um, I, I can't say comparably so to like, uh, you know, prior to when I was born, because I really don't know. Um, but it definitely is. Uh, I definitely think it's it's a much more uh, difficult thing to talk about uh, these days because people are so defensive um, in their views that they don't even, I, and I think it's, I think part of like, part of the thing that annoys me is that a lot of times these people are like uneducated about what they're talking about. Um, I think that they, they, they fixate on like a couple of different points and then that's, that's all they have. You know, that is all that for them, that is all their politics are and, and they're, they're fixated in that. It's like Yusufra who is fixated. What is, what is, so, oh, so true? Is that yeah, what you're so saying? Um, yeah, and I, I, all I wish is that um, everybody in their mind would really want to sit down and have a conversation, right? Not just to preserve democracy, but actually just because they want to connect with another person's humanity, right? Right. And I think the defensiveness has a lot to do with fear and it has a lot to do with the inability to let go of a let go and and think in complex ways. Right. And you do often have to have leisure time and you do have to have enough money and you do have to not have to worry about stuff all the time to be able to have the time and the desire to actually reflect, right? So I do think, um, I mean, the reason I teach philosophy is philosophy is our capacity for reflection. That's like, to me, that's the substance of the discipline. Now there's a lot of philosophers whom that's not true. Um, critical thinking, and they actually, uh, this woman wrote an article called Philosophy as Blood Sport. Because they're so trained, they can really trash people, right? Someone right. can say something and they can say there's six fallacies in what you just said. Character right. assassination, guilt by, you know. So my discipline is, is fraught, right? And that's too bad because if you make philosophy into an AK-47, you know, like you're not gonna have a democracy. Um, right, but I think in that, on that same note, like that's also holding people accountable from just, uh, just Well, saying. but you have to step back, you know, and you can't just attack them because they don't. Right, 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 right. I definitely so it would agree. be something like, okay, so, you don't like so-and-so because they like, you know, somebody else, right? And then you say, okay, does that ever happen to you, right? Try to try to do the golden rule thing, right? Right, right, right. I was more so talking about being like complacent when someone is just, I mean, just speaking, just like you said, you said fallacies, you know, you just said like false things, you know? And I definitely think it depends how you go about that conversation, but um, I don't know. I don't want people to go around saying things that aren't that aren't true, you know, mm -hmm. that, that 
you know, but it definitely is a fine line between like how we were just talking, how people can get aggressive and they can get defensive very quickly. Um, Cause we tend to think we know what we're talking about. And then when somebody tells you, you don't know what you're talking about, you are probably not going to be happy. Also, well, that, go ahead. That's part of the reason why I, like early in the class, I was like, I just don't have time for that. Or like talk, like just rationally talking to people because of people like that, who simply, I mean, it, it's a psychological notion. The more that people deny that your viewpoint is correct, the more your heels dig in. And I understand on some level that no matter what I say, people are going to have their beliefs, whether it's right or wrong. And like what Michael was saying, they're just going to spill this rhetoric like that they recycled over and over again. And I, I don't know, I, I, I find it vexing that I have to argue my existence to other people. Uh, and they can simply say, well, that's my opinion. And I have to just accept no, that. I know. That that's why Jordan, it annoys me when Lion students say, oh, Dr. Beck's class, you just give your opinion, you know? And it's, I think I hold you more accountable than that, right? You can't say at the end of the day, I know Muhammad's right and Jesus is wrong, like without any reasons. Um, I have had a few students though, it's, and I kind of admire them because they trust me not to grade them lower. But I had a student who said in their final, um, well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and no one comes to Father except by me. And I think you should be careful, Dr. Beck. <laughs> and the thing is, I thought, well, that took a lot of courage for that kid to say that, you know? And, and I wanted to just grade it on the academic quality of it. Did you have some quotes? And of course, I couldn't, they, it wasn't an A paper, you know, but I, I'm not going to give it a, an F flat out. I've had really good students who um, just never open their minds at the end of the class. Like, um, and I used to say, I'll tell you, I used to tell students in their final paper, you don't really have to change your mind in your worldview. You just have to show um, that you expanded it or there were some interesting ideas. But I got so many students that said, I didn't really change my mind, but and I'm saying, nope, I'm, you can't do that anymore. You have to say at least one thing that you changed your mind about. There must be something, right? Because I couldn't believe a college student wouldn't want to change their mind. I don't understand it. Like that's what college is about. Um, but I'd say right at this point in history after Fox News and you know the news thing, I would really like people to explain the narrative because people have a real desire to make sense out of the world. Just give them as much time as they need to explain how are you making sense of the world, right? And then you could sort of figure out well, where's something that would speak to them? Um, because what I did during COVID was I decided I was going to read a whole lot of books about what's been going on in this country since 1980, because I've been too busy. And I'm telling you, I read 35, 40 books, 250 page books, and I think systematically. So I would read the whole thing on a weekend so that it would sort of get in my brain. And I created this reading group and I did some scanning. And so I've got a lot of stuff in my brain, right? But there's no way I'm going to, you know, dump it on somebody else. My kids don't know a lot of this stuff. And I'm not sure how much they need to know. But um, that's why I know enough to know that I just have to listen. Um, part of the reason is at the end of the day, whatever else you know, you have to figure out what sort of laws we should make or what sort of politicians we should vote for or what two we should look for. And when it comes to that leadership, it really depends a lot 
on what people will respond to. And you can have all the knowledge in the world and know that what I would want a politician to say is not going to be what they say because 1% of the population would be moved by that. Does that make sense? And that's why I admire good political leaders because they can speak to people and move them in a good direction. And that's a talent way greater than just being able to read a bunch of books and get it in your head because you can think systematically, you know? So just because I have, I would say, tried to have informed ideas about politics and religion, it doesn't mean at all that I'm better than anybody else or that I would, some anybody should listen to me because it's not really about lecturing and professing. It's really about listening and communicating if you want to have a high quality of life. You have to communicate and you have to listen. Um, does that make sense, Michael? Um, that's why I, I, this is how what, you know, when I went to Lyon, it was 1996 and Bill Clinton was president and five out of six of the US Congress people were Democrats, okay? <laughs> and after 9-11, every single day, the country went more to the right. So I taught there for 20 years and every day I went to the office, it was worse, right? <laughs> From my point of view. Right. And so it just gets to the point where it's so far from where it ought to be that you just have to sit and try to bond with people because well, climate change, for example, I mean, we are really toast, but I followed it for 52 years, but I still have to get up in the morning and I still think that it's better to do something than nothing and it's better not to yell at people and it's better to try and just ask people what they think or, I mean, I know that the Koch brothers, these fossil fuel billionaires, control our political system. And so people are truly either misinformed or mostly distracted from it, but it, it doesn't help. But I will say when I was living in Arkansas, here's a thought for you that at first I wrote a lot of books about tragedy because uh, Karl Rove, there was a, a bunch of people that were rewriting our history saying that our founding fathers were conservative Christians and all. I mean, I knew it was all a lie. And I felt sorry for people because they were getting jerked around. It was very cynical and they had good intentions. And that, you know, so I, all my animosity was toward the guys on top, the puppet meisters, right? But then after about seven or eight years and after Obama got elected, I felt like you're not trying. Does that make sense? Like you're not trying to think critically or you're not trying not to be racist. Well, does like, that make uh, sense? Yes, it does. And when you were talking about earlier, you're talking about like your students not really changing their viewpoints in this class. And I was thinking how, you know, that definitely takes like abstract thought that some people have not yet developed. Um, but then when you started talking about like, um, like climate change, I mean, that is something that is just like proven like that. Like there's not really room for debate and that does not take abstract thought, um, but we still see like the same, you know, the same thing, you know. There's a book called Merchants of Doubt and I do have some scanned chapters. It's, it's really important. Like a dozen scientists can move the needle. And so they were, they were very respected physicists, all that. They worked on the nuclear bomb during the Cold War, and they were extremely paranoid about any kind of socialism, any kind of intervention into the market is, oh, it's Russia, it's China, whatever. And so they, they didn't want, okay, the first, I think the first thing was um, smoking causing cancer. Oh, no, you know, leave the government out of it. This is government intervention. And then it was secondhand smoke. And then it was 
um, the smokestacks, um, acid rain, and it was the same over and over. Sell the public doubt, just like you sell them any other product, sell doubt. And so my students had doubt, and I knew that you just bought the product, you know? <laughs> You just bought this thing that was marketed. That's the way it was marketed. And so, you know, it's been really hard, but it doesn't help to nothing. The only thing that helps is to just want to sit and talk to people. You know, I can sit there and say, it's the Koch brothers. You know, I can, but it doesn't help. It just, I don't know any other solution than to just authentically listen and assume that people want to believe the right thing or do the right thing. Does that make sense? I especially think that people who call themselves liberal really need to behave themselves, right? Because if you are smart and you're educated and you know that democracy requires listening, you have a big responsibility if you don't do that you're more culpable because you have natural ability, you had opportunity, you had education. So you should be the most, the best listeners. Does that make sense? Even though you actually have the data and all that, for the purposes of preserving a society, you have to listen. But this is easy for me to say at this point, what do you, th I mean, I understand you guys, you don't have time to do all that. But anyway, Jordan, what do you think? I was just talking about, that's what Malcolm X was talking about. Like, that's right. what's worse is a white liberal person who understands the problems that go on in society and still benefits off of it knowing such. And that's why they're a lot more insidious than people who actually just are point blank racist because they want to act. I, I have always found like, Harry Potter, uh, Professor Umbridge has always been worse to me than Lord Voldemort simply because uh, she wants to act like she's within the law and like she's doing the morally obligated thing. And people who act like they're doing the right thing while doing the wrong thing intentionally is so much worse to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, lukewarm, lukewarm activists or what did he call them? I can't remember, but yeah. He called, he called them foxes. He called them foxes in the in the hen house. <laughs> yeah, there's that. Um, and that's a problem. I mean, anyway, I, I uh, the thing I grieve about most is that I I'm handing off this horrible situation to the next generation, to my students. So usually I just grieve about it. It's just a matter of grief and then sort of picking up from the grief because we don't have to live this way. You know, we, we aren't by nature ignorant <laughs> and we, we are capable of empathy and we are capable of recognizing each other's um, issues, right? Paranoia, we can, we are capable of maintaining a democracy but I'm not sure we're going to do it. Um, and I, I wish I, I wish, I wish you all the best of luck. And I wish that my generation hadn't passed on things that we knew better. We knew better. We knew greed was not a good thing, but we somehow let people take it, take it over. Um, anyway, so next time will be Islam again. Let me show you. Um, so I was in Indonesia and I was asked to speak there's a whole lot of reading and you don't have to read all of it. Um, but I would, I do have a lot of outlines. And so if you could look at the outlines and then there's Islam in the environment, there's terrorism in Islam. So there's an outline for is, uh, environmental ethics. So if you want to page through the outlines and then read one of the articles, um, and then a lot of them are from when I was in Indonesia. And then I'll show you some pretty pictures from Indonesia and talk about Indonesia a little bit. And then we have, we actually have class 
on Thursday and the finals are on Friday. And so we are going to meet on Friday and have you present your um, outlines for your papers on Friday. And then the grades aren't due till Monday noon. And so you don't have to hand in everything until about Sunday at three o'clock so I can get it all read. Is everybody okay with that? Um, all right. Well, um, have a good day and I'll see you tomorrow. You have to class really quick. Sorry. Sure. Actually, same. I'm fine. Brian, you can hear this. I'm just, um, with my complications, I might have to take it incomplete until okay. I can do my work. No this problem. I'll sign whatever. And I'm even very good at signing things. I figured out the PDF and all that. <laughs> I appreciate that. I mean, there were there was a period there when sure I'll sign it, but I don't have any idea what to do about it. It was just awful. I, just, uh, I, I still am going to work every day. Like I went to work today, and that's from nine to that's from eight a.m. to five p.m. And then I have this class from seven to eight thirty, and then I also am just sick all the time. It's just really rough. I'm you know? so sorry, Jordan, and I appreciate that you have made the effort that you've made. And I don't think anybody will have a problem giving you an incomplete. And if anybody hesitates, you know, <laughs> uh, I can send an email, right? And um, I'll speak for you. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Of course. Y'all have a nice night. Yeah. I feel better. Thank you. Oh. Um, I don't know if you saw my text earlier before I got kicked out of Zoom because my Wi-Fi, but um, I read through your, your comments and I'm going to make my adjustments ASAP. I'm trying to finish my things and trying to get it done. Okay. Slowly but surely. But um, um, I was wondering what, um, what does my grade look like before the um, revisions that I'm going to do? Just so that I have like a mind. It would you know, be a B. It would be a B. Okay, awesome. Okay, I just, yeah, no, I'm just always the type of person that like, right. I don't know what I'm at before. I don't know. I just like. Well, gonna... the, the key for me is, do you understand it? Because you kept referring to a doctrine, mm -hmm. right? I think it was something like that, that you have these beliefs. And I kept saying, wait a second, isn't it virtues? Like how you live. So I just want you to make clear, what do you really want to say, right? Um. Are you saying that you just stand by your beliefs like Euthyphro? Or are you saying, I mean, that's not what you say in class very much, right? Yeah, I was trying to, I think what my paper was about, yeah, is this what, this one was about the comparison between Jesus and Confucius. So basically I was just trying to say that one of the things that they had similar was um, their ability to, or at least their drive to, um, you know, stand strong in what they believe in. That was one of the, sim that I was just trying to make similarities. That's kind of what my paper was kind of just trying, not, it wasn't as opinion-based. I mean, it was, cause like I'm making- Well, the thing is, yeah, I wouldn't say that, you know, I would say that they had these disciples, they asked them questions and they had compassion for people. That was the thing that really stood out. And that's very different mm -hmm. than they were strong in what they believed in. People who you know, I believe in this, they're often just not very pleasant people mm -hmm. and they're not interested in talking to people, mm -hmm. right? Do you see what I mean, right? Yeah. That's why I'm thinking it It might not be what you really want to say. So I'm going to add a um, paragraph now that you said that. I'm going to add a paragraph maybe about like their compassion, like yeah. their, because I think like, yes, in modern day society, like people, when they're stand, when they stand strong in their, their beliefs, they don't listen to other people. But I think what for me, what I'm saying was like, for example, Jesus, he stood, he did stand strong because he didn't say, oh, well, you can go in. Um, just don't believe in me. Don't believe. like, you know, he's like, I believe what I believe. You can take that or leave that. Like, you know, he said, this is the way and I'm showing you the way and God sent me. And this is what my job is here on earth. And this is what it is. And so like he stood strong in it. He didn't waver his beliefs in any type of situation he stood strong in it and so that that's kind of the only point that I was trying to make like I think if I add the paragraph about how like this is how it is in modern day society or like this is how a lot of people tend to um, stand strong in their beliefs however these two figures didn't stand strong uh, in their beliefs well put it this way he said love God love your neighbor mm -hmm. 
And then he said, I'd write the law in their heart. Mm -hmm. And so, and he always was compassionate, right? And that's, to me, that's very different than putting your heart first is very different than I'm standing strong in my beliefs. You know, to me, like, they're almost the opposite. Because if you have mercy for people, you know, you don't stand strong and make your beliefs into some kind of barrier. I think right? at least I'm comparing, like for me, how I think of it, like I can compare, like I'll use for me as an example, like I'm very strong in how I like perceive things. Like I have my beliefs and I'm very like, if anybody asks me what my beliefs are, I'm very like, out, like, you know, I'll speak what I feel and I'm not going to waver how I feel, but I'm also open-minded and then also compassionate like I understand that okay. some type of valid way and what they right do. so like I guess maybe if I add a paragraph like to ex maybe further explain right the idea of standing strong in belief doesn't wait to I because like for I'm just using myself as an example like I do stand strong in what I believe in like if anybody asks me hey Ryan what do you believe in I'm very like this is what I believe in but I'm never somebody to tell them, hey, you have to believe this too. Because I what think- What would you say you believe in? Like, I believe that there is a God. I believe that through him, like we're able to be here. I believe the origin story, that kind of thing. But I also believe that, um, like, I believe that we need to, for me personally, I need to have a relationship with God because that's what's best for me. And also I feel like, um, like I just find comfort in having a relationship with God um but I think that different religions philosophies everything every person has their own perspective and didn't walk the same life I did so I think that everybody has some type of knowledge regardless if it's with God or whatever it may be okay utilize and incorporate in my own faith that will make my faith stronger so it doesn't necessarily have to be hey this is god but they could believe hey this is from hinduism with all these different gods but i can pick up something from their religion that that helps me be a better person and so like that's what i believe in that like i have these morals in the sense of or i guess this idea that there is god i believe that that's what i believe in i stand strong in that i i feel his presence like he gives me comfort he gives me hope and strength so i believe he's real but i also believe that other people have different opinions and that they're valid in some way not exactly if they say oh i don't believe in god like i don't think that's right in my opinion but i think that they have some type of reasoning as why to you know if like i said earlier you know like if you engage in a conversation at some point you'll find some type of similarity or you'll find an overlap like that's something that i believe in and that kind of is like fits into like my world view which i actually might talk about in my last paper because i feel like that's kind of interesting Okay, well, that works. Um, so that's good. Yeah. All okay. right. Okay, I'll add that in. But thank you. Um, I'll add those revisions and then I'll send that in as soon as possible. So you said Sunday, everything's due. We'll probably have yeah, it. Yeah, I don't want keep handing it in when you get it done. Because if yeah, you I'm wait, sure. and everybody hands in five things yeah. at three o'clock on Sunday. It's yeah. I had when I was teaching in Asia, those they had a lot of obstacles, but I literally got 88 things to read, oh like God. within two days or something. And I, you know, for a student to say I never had any time until all of a sudden I had enough time to write eight things, I just like yeah, that's a hard time believing that. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, that's what I don't want to happen. So yeah, okay, well, I'll get it done ASAP. Okay, okay. Thank you. we'll see you. Bye. Bye bye. Um, stop the recording. <laughs>